This is Manhattan Insights, a Manhattan Institute production. I'm Raihan Salam. Between 1910 and 1970, six million black migrants left the Deep South in search of a better life, most of whom settled in urban centers in the Northeast, Midwest, and West. But today, a new great migration is underway. Increasingly, younger, college-educated black Americans are leaving demographically stagnant cities like Chicago and New York for the burgeoning suburbs of Atlanta, Dallas, and Houston. So what's driving this trend, and what does it mean for Black American life? Joining us to discuss just that is Charles Blaine, president of the Urban Reform Institute, a think tank dedicated to advancing free market policy solutions for America's cities. Originally from New Jersey, he's now based in Houston. He'll be interviewed by our guest host for today, Mene Ukwebarua of the Wall Street Journal editorial board. When you look at some of the hubs, Atlanta, Charlotte, Houston, Dallas, places like that, the vestiges of the racist past have seemed to fade away, and you still have a lot of opportunities moving down here, more manufacturing coming, factories, plants, and different things like that, that provide a new wave of economic opportunities. And so when you're talking about this kind of reverse migration, it is as though the South is the new great hope. There's so much opportunity here. But I wanted to begin by talking about the historic trend that we're going to be talking about today. Uh, we have seen really since the pandemic, beginning in 2020, there's been an acceleration of a trend that was already underway. We've had a lot more blacks leaving uh, cities like Chicago, Philadelphia, New York. The share of the black population living in those regions has decreased quite a lot recently. Um, and most of them are moving to places like Texas, places like Florida. And I wonder in the broadest possible strokes, if you could describe what you see as driving this trend. Yeah, you know, it's a, I love this story because my family is no exception to that. My immediate family and extended family, um, my, my parents, my father is from South Carolina originally, and my mother is from Alabama, and they both moved to New Jersey um, in the 60s and 70s. Um, you know, it, my dad was a little older when he moved up there. My mom was younger. Um, and then recently in the past five years, they moved to South Carolina. They decided to retire and go there. And myself, you know, I'm originally from New Jersey and moved to Texas. And we have family that has gone from the south from states like alabama and south carolina to detroit long island other parts of new york new jersey all these northern states and now we're starting to see a shift back and um it, it's been really interesting to watch particularly from a texas perspective because of how they've benefited how this state has benefited from a lot of that growth and um most of what you know even just taking my parents for example the reason they moved was just economic reasons they were living in north new jersey um they wanted to retire they wanted to be able to kind of live happily do travel and all these other things that come with retirement. But looking just at the bottom line of staying in a place like northern New Jersey, just outside of New York, it wasn't a reasonable bet for them to make. And so they decided to move south. And I think a lot of folks are starting to see that as well, um, because the south has changed. South and southwest have changed over a year over the years. And it's not what it used to be. I think a lot of people in the Northeast, even friends that I still have, um, you know, have kind of mis misconceptions about what it is to be in the South and what that means. And we're seeing robust economic growth, housing affordability, tons of opportunity, um, even educational opportunities. And so I think it's right for people to, to come on down. So do you have a, a sense of the scale here? Do you have any numbers to point to for people who want to get a sense of, is this just a lifestyle change that some small proportion of blacks are making? Or do we have anything to really point to? Um, how has the share of the black population in some of these southern cities grown? How has it decreased in the north? Uh, could you point us in that direction? Yeah. So, I mean, even just looking at the Houston area, you know, back in, I want to say the 60s, Houston and Harris County, more specifically, was about 70 percent white. It was something around, you know, 20 percent black and then kind of a mix of, of everything else. And now we're seeing the black population get closer to 30. We're still not at 30, but the white population has dropped down to about 41 percent. Asian population has exploded. Hispanic population has exploded as well. Um, just last week, a report came out showing that Texas has officially um, shifted demographically, whereas Hispanics are now the majority population there. And when you look at a lot of the suburbs, surrounding Houston, you see a lot of growth in, uh, in in black residents. I mean, Fort Bend County, which is just adjacent to Houston and Harris County, is one of our fastest growing counties. And in, in a city there, Missouri City, has seen dramatic growth in, in black residents. I think they're about at 40 percent now of that city um, being being black people. And then in, same thing with um, uh, Sugar Land. We're seeing a lot of black residents move there. And 
Uh, there's enough Fort Bend in Fort Bend County. The city of Fort Bend has seen a lot of growth there too. I think they said something over the past 20 years, we've seen like 40% of, of a rate growth there. And so we are seeing a lot of changes. And when you're polling a lot of these people, particularly when it comes to political polling, um, and trying to just see kind of where the political winds are shifting and you're, you're comparing that to where they're moving from, we're seeing a lot of moving from the Northeast in particular in California as well. But there's been a lot of moving from the Northeast, mostly because of the economic drivers. Absolutely. And I wanted to back up a little bit to the history behind this movement, uh, just to make sure that listeners understand the scale of the change in direction that's taking place in recent years. If you go back to the beginning of the 20th century, you had about 80 to 90 percent of American blacks living in the traditional South. And movement began to the Midwest and to the northeastern cities in the early 20th century uh, as jobs started to boom in those places. You had the dawn of the era of manufacturing, uh, and you also had things like unionization uh, and integration of government jobs during that period that created a lot of opportunity for really poor rural Southern blacks who were trying to find more opportunity for themselves and were not able to find it in the legacy South. And so you had the black population in the South uh, really hit its crater around 1970 or so and began to tick up before that. What we're seeing in recent years with the movement back to the South uh, has been described by many people as a kind of reverse great migration. And so I wonder if you could talk about the the issues that drove blacks to seek opportunity in the northern cities, some of the problems that arose with that as the black population grew in these cities and blacks actually became a majority in a lot of these very large northern cities. Uh, and then what are the implications behind the move back to the south have been in light of that history? Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, and, and, you know, even speaking to New Jersey, we saw a lot of um, during this time that you mentioned, a lot of black people moving up there for just the, the industry, the economic opportunities, the industrialization they were seeing. Um, you know, New Jersey was heavily manu heavy manufacturing, and we know the same thing for places like Detroit and elsewhere. And there were so many opportunities there for them that they were not finding in the South. Um, cost of living might not, been, not, might not have been much better, but they were finding these opportunities that were kind of leveling the playing field for them to be able to attain that American dream or kind of what they, they had seen as that. Um, this was like a whole new world opening up to them where they were able to leave the, the Jim Crow South, the racist South, and, and enter an era and enter a place where opportunity was provided for them the same way that it was for other people. And so you did see these just the massive moves up there. And, and you know, I, I wrote a bit about some of the political trends that we saw uh, during that time. And, and it, particularly in places like Chicago, we, you know, for a long time, when black people were building up their political power in places like Chicago, they were... Uh, they were being considered. And what I mean by that is that the issues that were that they had to deal with on a day to day basis were something that were genuinely considered in, in what po politicians, elected officials, policymakers were pushing forward in these cities. Um, and we could talk about the second half of that a little later, but just kind of to allude to it, it doesn't seem as though we're seeing the same thing today in a lot of our major cities is that the issues that black Americans are facing on a day to day basis in our major urban areas aren't necessarily being addressed by those elected officials that they keep in office. Um, and so as we started to see that growth, you started to see some of those problems arise. And I think the South was really poised to take advantage of a lot of um, the the frustrations that that started to grow out of some of these cities. You know, the the when you look at some of the hubs, Atlanta, Charlotte, Houston, uh, Dallas, uh other places, even even in Florida, Miami, and places like that, the the, the vestiges of the of the racist past have seemed to fade away, and you still have a lot of opportunity. You have much more opportunity than you had then, for sure. But you have a lot of opportunity now. Um, you see businesses moving down here, more manufacturing coming, factories, plants, and different things like that that provide a new wave of economic opportunity. And so, when you're talking about this kind of reverse migration, it is as though the the South is the new great hope. There's so much opportunity here, and you still have that cost of living aspect. I think when in the last numbers I saw out of Houston, average one bedroom apartment rent was something like eleven to twelve hundred dollars in comparison to New York, which is probably around twenty three hundred dollars right now. You know, we don't have an income tax, uh, just overall lower regulations would provide better opportunity if you want to purchase a home and all these other things that factor in your day to day life. And so as long as as these southern states and particularly southern major metros continue to 
foster an environment for that growth, I think they're going to see a continued influx of uh, black uh, residents moving down here. And they have to prepare for that. I think what we're seeing a lot in Houston is there was this massive growth into the urban core, the city center, um, up until about the pandemic. And and then as we've seen a lot of major cities, then we started seeing growth to the suburbs and the exurbs. But even so, with that growth into the urban core, the city wasn't perfectly poised to to take care of that there were a lot of issues that arose from that dealing everything from infrastructure to crime to all these uh, all these other issues and so it pushed people out at a faster rate and so as long as these major urban areas in the south can prepare themselves for the influx of people that they're going to see and that they have been seeing and truly focus on core services rather than some of the you know extracurriculars that they tend to to engage engage with i think we'll see um more opportunity abound for black people as they continue to move to the south Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you could describe uh, what life looks like for a middle class black person living in a city like Houston today or some of these fast growing suburbs around Houston, but also around the Dallas area um, and in other states as well. Uh, If you could paint the picture, what kind of industries are people working in when they move to some of these fast growing, affordable uh, sunbelt areas? areas? Uh, What does life and recreation look like? I wonder what are the draws uh, for people who are used to growing up in these very dense, very old northern and midwestern cities? Uh, Just paint the picture a little bit. Sure. Um, So I'll take, you know, the city of Pearland, um, for for example, which is just outside of Houston. It's a suburb of Houston. And we've seen a lot of black people moving there. I think they've seen a 66 percent growth in, in black residents over a 10 year span. And what life looks like there is not unlike what you would find like um, in in an exurb or suburb of northern New Jersey, just outside of New York, except it's more affordable. Um, so, you know, uh, one of the big things that I often hear when I talk to friends and, and just anyone from the Northeast is, you know, the, the lack of transportation options that are that are down here in Texas. But we still do have those options. We have plenty of transportation options. We have mass transit that runs across the region. It's certainly not as organized and, and you know consolidated as places like New York, but it's still there. But in terms of recreation, what we're also seeing is that a lot of these exurbs and suburbs are competing for residents. So they're going out of their way to not be a bedroom community, to actually build the amenities in these neighborhoods so that you don't necessarily have to go into the city. So we're talking about everything from, you know, outdoor music pavilions to uh, concert halls and and theaters and uh, plenty of green space and parks, which isn't something that you typically associate, I think, with Houston. Um, and so you see a lot of this great. A- a- and you also, when it comes to employment, we have long been kind of an oil and gas town. And so whether you were inside the city or in some of the exurbs or suburbs, you worked in oil and gas, whether that's at a refinery or, or one of the headquarters downtown. But what we've seen there as well is we've seen some of the headquarters move out of the urban core and move to other uh, areas in the region. And we've seen the job jobs diversify we have we're not miami when it comes to tech but we're starting to see more growth in tech and tech opportunities here um the medical center i mean we do have the largest medical center medical complex in the world and it's a you know robust and innovative and you have a lot of folks who work in there all the way you know every level of spectrum i mean my parents were were janitors for our school district growing up and so you have folks who are doing that obviously all the way up to being doctors and and ceos of of the medical center and and the organizations within and so you have a lot of opportunity here uh, just across the board i mean even when it comes to to hospitality and restaurants you know that houston is, is a massive food scene and it's a very diverse food scene the city in and of itself we have i think a 145 languages spoken in the city. Uh, you have a very large population of Nigerians. We have Cajuns. We have um, Vietnamese and, and just a, a wide swath of Southeast Asians. I mean, you have kind of everyone you can think of here. And, and you find that when you go into different neighborhoods. I mean, they often say that there aren't places that you can go at one o'clock in the morning and find like uh, Vietnamese crawfish. and you But you can find that here. And you find these different things that you don't necessarily find elsewhere and that you d- wouldn't necessarily associate with Texas. And I think the same when you look up at North Texas, Dallas and Fort Worth, they're seeing a diversification of their job market as well. Um, you know, it is a little different in the sense that with North Texas, you have a bunch of smaller cities that are consolidated in and around Dallas and Fort Worth. Whereas in the Houston area, kind of Houston is the big thing. And then you have some small cities that are around the side. 
but not nearly as many as the DFW area. But up there, it offers you the diversification of places to live and things that you want to do and, and even more competition when it comes to these suburban and exurban areas because you have more of them. Um, one of the things Texas, I think, does really well is that we do not let our counties zone or even pass really heavy handed regulations. So when you look outside of our cities in the un what we call unincorporated parts of the county, you're really kind of allowed to do whatever you want. And some people think that that might mean uh, just kind of the wild, wild west, but it it's not. We see kind of communities organize themselves in the ways that they see fit and they remain affordable. They keep housing prices relatively low. I mean, you can still find very nice housing in the unincorporated areas for under, you know, 300,000, 200, roughly 200,000, um, still close into the city of Houston, where if you are working, whether that's five days a week or if you're on somewhat of a remote or hybrid work schedule, and you're only going into the city a handful of, or a few days a week, you have those options of still living further out and having all of these amenities that you wouldn't find elsewhere. Um, one other example I'll bring up is we have a, uh, it, we call it a city, but it's technically not a city. It's an unincorporated um, municipal utility district, which is just a, a special purpose district north of the city of Houston. And it's called the Woodlands and it's been booming and they have, I, I can't even, I don't even know what the population is now, but they recently did a, ha held a vote to incorporate into a city and that vote went down in flames and in large part because they live in the unincorporated areas. They don't have heavy handed zoning. They don't have heavy handed uh, regulations that, that stymie economic growth and all these other things. And so the residents there rejected this push to incorporate because they didn't want that. They like what they have. They like what is going on there. And they like the growth that they have, the unencumbered growth that they have because of where they live. And so we do do that in a lot of our incorporated areas. And even in these places that are technically cities, you see a lot of competition for people to move there. We, you know, Howard Hughes Corporation, which is the corporation that built the Woodlands initially moved their headquarters up there from the city of Houston years ago. And they have been just doing so much work bringing medical technology companies in, infrastructure, broadband, just so many different things to provide opportunities to people living in the woodlands so that they would no longer be a better community having drive, to drive 40 minutes into the city of Houston to work and then drive back out. And what they're seeing now is that the traffic flows that used to bring traffic and, and people sitting in rush hour heading into Houston is now the other way around where there are people sitting in traffic heading into the woodlands. And so what I what I think Texas and, and a lot of these states that still have a lower regulatory framework and, and you know, low tax structure um, and an easy opportunity to start uh, businesses and, and, and still have a nice housing affordability. What you're seeing is a lot of this competition and you're seeing them go gangbusters to compete for these people who are moving there and in large part for black people, because we know that they are looking for these opportunities to shift from renting to owning and to possibly start a business or looking for more gainful employment and all these other things. So, um, I, you know, I, I think the future is bright as again, as I said before, as long as we continue down this path and don't go the way of some other major cities. Yeah, I can picture exactly what you're describing here, Charles. Uh, I have been to the Houston area and seen some of these semi-suburban communities that exist right outside of it and, and also within the city limits because like many southern cities, um, it is big and is somewhat sprawling. But because there's so much opportunity there, there's a lot of new construction, both with homes and with businesses. Uh, and you do have a lot of people being able to buy spacious, affordable homes. You have lots of these areas that have outdoor suburban malls that are very amenity rich, allow people to have a very vibrant lifestyle and a lot of recreation without having to go into the downtown. Uh, there are similar things in the Atlanta area where I've spent a decent amount of time in places like Alpharetta. You do see people increasingly choosing to place themselves right outside of the main core of the cities uh, in order to have a a good blend of lifestyle um, and affordability. And I think it's interesting that you point out how diverse Houston is and is becoming, because I think when people think of immigrants to the United States, for example, they often imagine people coming to the U.S. just to gain a foothold, to get a good, stable, well-paying job, um, and not necessarily focusing on things like amenities or things like space. But what we've seen in recent decades is that a lot of people come to this country uh, to live the American dream to the fullest. They 
might come to big, dense cities in the very beginning um, where they happen to have relatives and uh, take a job that allows them to live stably for the short term. But after a certain amount of time, they want to own a home and a car just like anyone else. Um, and that is always been true of American blacks and is increasingly true as we've seen as well. Um, and so it makes sense to me that uh, as more opportunity becomes available in these less dense, more affordable places in the American South and Southwest, that people are increasingly seizing the opportunity to, to live in that way. But so far, we've, we've talked a lot about, no, go ahead. I was just going to say, you make such a great point. And I think what we've seen a lot here and in many cities is that when people do immigrate here and, and they don't have a good foothold of what the city is and where to go and things like that, it's easy to just default to a certain neighborhood. But when they're provided the opportunity to live somewhere else because cost of living is good, because they can still get to work, because they have access to childcare and all these other things that come with life, they do start to kind of venture out and see what other things that it, the city has to offer. And I think we're seeing that just all across uh, the Houston region. Um, you know, we, we did a report years ago called the New American City, and, and it was looking at where people were moving. And we focused very heavily on the Houston region. And, and that's what we were finding, which was that a lot of folks who moved here, who immigrated here from another country, kind of planted roots in, in a certain area that they may have might have felt comfortable, whether it was family there or whether it was just cultural, um, a cultural stronghold for them. They, they started there, but then they moved elsewhere. And oftentimes that was out of the city. And to that point, we've seen over the past few years, Houston, the city, Houston proper, its population start to decline. I think it was two years ago, we saw the first decline after five years of stagnation. Um, and then this year, we also saw another decline of about, I think something around 11,000 and change. But at that same, as that's happening, we're seeing growth in the unincorporated parts of the county. So it is showing that people are choosing to move out of city proper and into these other areas because of the opportunities that are there. Exactly. I think we saw the same thing, frankly, with middle class whites uh, in the middle of the 20th century who had um, lived in the denser cores of cities. But as soon as they were able to uh, often move to the suburbs uh, because of the improved lifestyle that it afforded um, and also to escape some of the increasing perils that existed in these northern and Midwestern cities uh, during that period of, of civil unrest. And that's exactly the direction I wanted to go, because we've talked a lot about the draw of the Sun Belt and why blacks are increasingly choosing to live there. We haven't talked quite as much yet about what they are leaving behind um, in cities like New York, cities like Chicago and Philadelphia and so on. Uh, and I wonder if you could comment on how crime might play into this question. I think that this is particularly important in the past three or so years since the pandemic. As our listeners will surely know, there's been an increase in violent crime in almost every large American city during that period period of time. Uh, and blacks often have been the biggest victims of this increase because they happen to live in some of the densest, often the poorest and often most dangerous neighborhoods. Do you think that crime has played a role in uh, encouraging blacks to move out of some of these uh, legacy northeastern and midwestern cities uh, and seek a different sort of lifestyle elsewhere? Yeah, without a doubt. And we actually just did um, some work on this and, and we're kind of finalizing it to put it out here shortly. Um, we're, we're So it, I mentioned the previous project we did, the, the Next American Cities, and we're doing another one kind of a follow up called the New American Cities, which looks at uh, you know, the previous one looked at where people are moving. And then now we're looking at post pandemic, where they're moving and where they're consolidating and kind of what the, the reasons are for that. And we did a survey. And in that survey, we asked that question about crime, how did that play a role? I mean, we asked a whole host of things from portability to you know heavy handed regulations and all these other things. But crime was one of the questions, how much of a role that played in, in, in folks choice in moving and particularly for minorities and particularly for black people it really played a big role i think we were looking at something around um well i don't want to i'm not sure of the numbers i'm not going to say it because i'm not exactly certain but um it did play a large role and and even anecdotally when we're talking to folks who are moving here and kind of surveying them on their choice to move they did choose to move from one big city to another big city, but they felt as though a big city in the South might be more kind of amenable to, to their place and to their stage in life and not being consolidated in an area where they felt they were being over police. And so even here, though, we're seeing that same situation with folks who are living in, you know, first ward in Houston, third ward, fourth ward, fifth ward, which are predominantly black neighborhoods that 
feel that they have been over policed for decades. We're starting to see those people move out to, which I mentioned before, the Pearlands, which saw a 66 percent increase in black residents over a 10 year span, Sugar Land and Fort Bank County, because they feel that that the situations are more favorable to them there. So I do think policing plays a huge role. And I know that, you know, during the the, the unrest of 2020, we, we had a a a lot of the southern cities were able to stave off some of the things that the northern city saw with the with you know rioting and looting and and all of that and houston is no exception and they prided themselves on kind of integrating in these communities well in advance i mean this has been kind of a long-running thing but particularly around this time you know i remember that our police chief got a lot of uh black for for kind of just taking off his uniform putting on regular clothes and getting out there and marching with folks and talking to them and trying to just calm calm frustrations and it worked i mean in large part his, his efforts and the efforts of the police department worked and i think we see a lot of that in southern cities now i mean i think part of it is trying to you know make amends for issues in the past and and try to bridge those gaps because they know how many communities are um are, are hesitant and reluctant to work with the police. And so there is extra effort put into that. But we are seeing uh, crime play a huge issue in that. And even today, again, Houston, we are dealing with a, a crime issue, although we're seeing violent crime drop. I think we've seen violent crime drop about 10 percent in the past year. We still have other issues that are taking place. And because of that, people are still moving out of the city and are attributing that to to be the cause. I mean, from catalytic converter thefts to jugging, which is, you know, following folks home from the bank to their house, or even we're, we're seeing an increase in people being followed home from gun shops to their home for criminals wanting to steal guns out of their car and things like that. So you are seeing people move out to the suburbs and excerpts because there is a better focus on policing there. And I think it's also um, an issue I alluded to before, which is with a lot of these cities actually focusing on core services. You know, while, while the city of Houston has done well for itself, it is not an exception in the sense that it, 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 it doesn't stave off this push, this progressive push to get involved in all these other issues from time to time. I, I would love to say that the city of Houston focused primarily on poor services all the time and address the needs of all its citizens, but it gets caught up in a lot of this political rhetoric that we see in a lot of major urban areas. And so for that, you do see some of these suburbs and exurbs that do push uh, or, or do focus very heavily on the things that matter. And I think because of that, you see people continuing to move there. They're putting more resources in policing and doing it right in the way that they know will actually address crime rather than trying to test different methods out that that are uncertain and during a crime wave that might not, you know, be the best time to be trying new new endeavors. We're seeing cities use ARPA funds, American Rescue Plan Act funds to try different things, novel ideas that might address crime, but don't necessarily prove to in the long run. And so I think for that, people are, are opting for places that they know is gonna, are going to put a premium on core services and address the needs like crime. I, I appreciate that you touched on the struggle in some of these uh, southern cities to address the crime problem and the debate among people who live in these cities about how to do it and whether they're going to take a different approach from the progressive establishment uh, in some of the very, very deeply uh, democratic cities that you see in the Northeast. And I wonder, for a mayor like Sylvester Turner in Houston, um, would you say that he has taken a different tack um, from uh, the defund movement that we saw in 2020? Or are some of these black mayors uh, under heavy pressure uh, to align themselves with the progressive anti-policing movement that we've seen nationally? No, uh, you, I mean, you hit the nail on the head with your first comment. And I, and I give Mayor Turner a, a lot of credit for that, for being able to stave off that push from the progressive wing of his party. And actually, I wrote about this for City Journal at the time um, when that issue did come up in the city of Houston. And I think, you know, to your point, um, Eric Johnson in in Dallas is, is the same, you know, fighting back against this push to defund the police. And so when it came up in Houston, we have we at the time we had just had an election and we, for the first time, had a predominant, uh, a majority black city council. And the black districts are still democratic, but they're much more conservative than the the white democratic districts. And so, for that reason, you get black democratic council members who lean conservative in in their views on things. And so, when the, the defund the police movement came here, we I remember the the city's public safety committee hearing. Um, for the first time had, I think it was 100 plus people sign up to virtually testify because we we're still in the midst of COVID. And 
hours of testimony because of this. And usually this is a sleepy hearing with maybe five or six people showing up to, to say something. And they started going through all the, the speakers and I don't know, maybe 20 speakers in all repeating the same thing that they wanted the city of Houston to shift money away from policing or reimagine policing and put it towards other things. Some of the black city council members started asking, you know, what zip code are you calling in from? Or just flat out asking what race you are, because they were hearing two separate things. Their districts were telling them, no, we need police. We just want the situation. We want better policing. We want more better relationships with police, but we still need them, particularly during a crime wave, as opposed to the people who were testifying, saying that they wanted to defund the police. And what they found was that most of these people were either uh, identified as, you know, white and progressive, or they were from a zip code that was outside of the city of Houston or in a predominant white neighborhood and so a lot of the black i mean there were less than a handful of black people who were calling in to parrot that message of defund the police and so houston saved that off they actually put more funding towards police that year um and in this year they put even more funding towards police and broke um the police budget by a billion dollars for the first time because they do want to address the issues that are happening and then at the same time mayor mayor uh, johnson in dallas was pushing against the defund the police movement his city council kind of went a different way and he has been in odds with them ever since but i do think that these black mayors and many of these black city council members who do come from predominantly black neighborhoods understand that those communities didn't want that they just wanted reform in the way they were policed rather than reformed in the amount that they were policed or the number of police that were in their neighborhoods and at the time you know we had a hispanic police chief now we have a black police chief both have taken uh community policing and truly integrating themselves in, into the community very seriously and i think that has helped in the long run in like i mentioned before saving off some of the issues when it came to the, the rioting and and looting that happened in other cities but also just other issues that arise on a day-to-day -day basis i mean we're we're um no stranger to to police and civilian shootings but the way that they've been handled i think has been better than most and we don't end up seeing the the same situations that you find in other cities and so i i do give sylvester turner um a lot of credit for the way he handled that and his council for a lot of a lot of credit for the way they handled that because i think it would have been easy particularly as democrats and, and with the national conversation that was happening to go along with that narrative um you know but to buck their party and buck the trends at the time because they knew that on the ground that that wasn't what people wanted the people that they serve um i, I definitely give them a lot of credit for that absolutely and i think it's helpful to point out that there are definitely blacks planted firmly on both sides of the policing issue. Of course, you do see uh, the defund movement was supported by quite a lot of influential black leaders, uh, mostly who are connected to academia uh, and who are connected often to unions. And so you can see a, a politician like Brandon Johnson, the new mayor of Chicago, uh, as one who has been uh, firmly on the side of reducing the police presence on the streets, uh, advocating the message that police are a negative influence in the lives of poor and middle class blacks and suggesting that police are actually behind some of the crime problems. Uh, and so I don't want to suggest that there are not a lot of blacks who are in favor of of that movement. But in poll after poll, uh, when you try to get the, the broad sweep of black opinion, blacks tend to be in favor of a more active police presence. And that's obviously very easy to understand given that blacks often are the uh, direct victims of a lot of the crime in these dangerous neighborhoods, uh, often at the hands of black perpetrators. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, I want to, to point that out. But uh, another issue that uh, probably has been very influential in the movement of blacks uh, to the South and Southwest is the yeah, chance at a better schooling opportunity for their children if they happen to be raising kids. Uh, we have seen in some of these heavily black cities uh, in the north uh, some of the worst performing schools in the United States. The school districts in cities like Philadelphia, New York, Chicago are usually among the bottom performers in the country, despite having very robust funds uh, compared with most of the comparable school districts you could point to. I would definitely say that the 
urban school districts in the South are not necessarily uh, setting the world on fire with performance either. Nobody is suggesting uh, that there is a, a night and day difference between these schools. But as we've mentioned, if you go just a little bit outside the core cities to these areas where a lot of blacks happen to be moving, you do find much better performing public schools. And you also find a, a higher density of alternative types of schooling that could be affordable for a middle class person, uh, private schools, charter schools, and things of that sort. And so I wonder if you could point to any evidence or anything that you've observed to suggest that uh, education might be one of the drivers of this shift uh, in black residents. Yeah, well, you know, and uh, I'm glad that you that you brought up the point that that, you know, it's not a night and day difference, because I know here in the city of Houston, the urban core, we're, we're having our own struggles with Houston ISD. Um, it's it's the largest school district in the state, seventh largest in the country. And um, just as of June 1st, it was taken over by the state because it could not get itself out of what's considered uh, improvement required standards, which is having a number of failing campuses for five consecutive years. And so because they were unable to do that, the state came in um, and, and this is the the biggest state takeover obviously since it's the largest district but the state has tip traditionally taken over very small districts if at all um usually they would try to do some other half measure instead of just fully stepping in but they they did this time because of that issue and what we're seeing is and what we've what we've learned from a lot of the black people who've moved out of the city of houston it's for the reason you mentioned education is a a a you know, massive issue when you have children. And when you look in the city of Houston and look at the cost of um, private schooling, you're looking at maybe 15 on the low end thousand dollars and it could go up. And of course there's, uh, you know, scholarships and all these other things that can offset that cost a bit. But when you're moving outside of the city of Houston and moving into unincorporated areas, whether that's surrounding Bear County in San Antonio, Harris County in Houston, Travis County in Austin or, or uh, Dallas County and in, 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 uh, the Fort Worth area, you do find a reduced cost for private schooling. You do find a better student to teacher ratio, student to support staff ratio, um, a, a stricter focus on the basics rather than on all these other things that the culture war fights that we see happening um, in a lot of the urban cores. We were we were comparis comparing a couple of school districts last week and looking at um, a, a school district called Spring Branch ISD, which is technically in the city of Houston. However, it's not part of Houston ISD. It's in one of the suburbs. And then Houston ISD and um, the district out um, in Pearland and just kind of looking at the issues that were coming up in their school boards. And at the time, I mean, Houston school board has been replaced with a board of managers because of the state takeover. But the issues that they're discussing, you know, they, for instance, the city of Houston uh, or Houston ISD rather um, saw a 61 percent increase in the in the district. Uh, fun, uh, sorry, the the central staff funding. So we're just talking about administrators and everyone in the central office over the sa over a five year period. And in that period, the district lost twenty seven thousand students. And so as they're hemorrhaging students who are moving out to whose families are moving out into these unincorporated areas, central staff, central office funding is going up. And you're still struggling with a lot of campuses that don't have nurses, that don't have librarians, that don't have libraries and don't have the extracurricular activities post and preschool um, services that help keep these kids off the street. And then when you look at the districts outside, they're providing services before school, services after school, summer opportunities, um, plugging them in summer jobs programs, all these other things that you would typically expect to find from a school district, particularly from a large school district that's very well funded, but you're not finding those and so people are moving out to start seek out those better opportunities and what we are seeing is that the school districts that are in these um, excerpts and suburbs are getting better ratings from the Texas Education Agency. Um, and it hasn't been consistent. I mean, this has only been in the past five or six years that we're seeing that shift, you know, grow. It, I mean, they've always been doing better in certain parts, but we're seeing it grow in that delta widen uh, significantly now because of the shift in the, in the public pressures that are coming into these big urban school districts. And even when you watch some of these school district meetings, the things that a lot of these organized groups are coming to advocate for or testify on aren't about student outcomes. They're about different issues, cult largely cultural issues that they that they want to engage in. And again, I think it goes back to, to 
what we said about cities and not focusing on core services. I think with these urban districts and so many competing interests, it's, lo- it's easy for them to get somewhat distracted by all these other things, all these squeaking toys, rather than focusing on the needs of the students. And so that's, you know, that's where we are. And, and um, our, our HISD is going to be in, in uh, state conservatorship, if you will, for presumably five years. I mean, if they get out of it, it, that's not even to say that they will because they've been given warnings over the years and and these campuses remain to fail. And so parents had no choice but to leave. HISD does have charter schools and magnet schools and all these other opportunities, but the competition is so high. And if you want to pull them out and go to a private school, the cost is so high that the only option you really have is to move and go somewhere else. Yeah, no, I, I definitely have seen the exact same trend of uh, people finally realizing that these school districts in some of these urban cores don't have the ability to fix themselves. Um, and you have states intervening in some cases. Uh, and there seems to be a, a broader awareness among a lot of blacks in particular, often who have been stuck in some of these worst performing districts, uh, that a different approach is needed as opposed to always uh, entertaining every teacher's union request to just increase the funding and hope that that's going to fix the problem. I wanted to talk a little bit about how education is not only affecting where blacks choose to live and some of the policies they're pushing for, but also increasingly might be affecting uh, how they choose to vote. And I think an interesting example of this uh, is in Florida in 2018, in the first gubernatorial run of Ron DeSantis. I remember just just after Ron DeSantis's surprise victory against Andrew Gillum, who was the mayor of Tallahassee, who was a young black man and was seen as many as seen by many as uh, you know potential future presidential candidate if he were to win there, uh, you know, so a, a potential national black political figure. But Ron DeSantis was able to beat him very narrowly, and one of the things that we saw was that. Part of the reason for DeSantis's victory was that he overperformed among black female voters. And a lot of the analysts after this election believe that that shift among black female voters was because of school choice. Florida is a state, again, where a lot of these cities where blacks tend to cluster um, have very poorly performing public schools. Ron DeSantis made a centerpiece of his campaign, uh, reforming school systems and also promoting school choice, uh, increasing vouchers and allowing people to send their kids to affordable private schools uh, if they so chose. Uh, And that was an influential enough message that it was able to get a lot of black women in that state who presumably are mostly legacy Democratic voters to say, I'll take a chance on this guy because I know it's going to have a direct impact on the lives of my children. Uh, I wonder if you, if you have seen any evidence of the same. Is the education issue uh, something that is leading blacks to reevaluate the way that they vote? Well, unfortunately, not the education issue that we've seen here lately. And, there, and the reason I say that is because we our, so our school districts are um, entirely removed from our 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 local governments, and so there are there are their own entities. And in those specific elections, we've still seen um, black women in particular, but the black vote in general, going towards the Democrat uh, school board trustees that have been that have been elected. However, in our November 2022 election for uh, county judge, which essentially is the county administrator, or county mayor, if you will. Um, we had two Hispanic women, two Hispanic millennials running against each other. The incumbent, Lena Hidalgo, 32 years old, um, and and her challenger, Alex Miller, roughly 36 years old. Um, and so what we did see with that is that that black men were more inclined to support the Republican Alexandra Mueller in that simply, uh, well, not simply, but I think in large part because of the crime issue that we were dealing with at the time. We were... Um, we had in 2018, 2016 and 2018, we saw a massive sweep of our judiciary, which had largely been um, Republican and, and, and white. Uh, we saw them lose to black women, what they called the, uh, you know, uh, they called it the black women magic group. And so it was a, a group of black women who were running together kind of on a slate and they wiped out our judiciary and won in two consecutive elections for our, our Harris County District Courts. And then we saw them implementing um, 
criminal justice reform from the bench in the way that in reshaping the the local system in the way that they wanted. And so we saw an increase of defendants out on on repeat bonds and different things like that. And in some instances, some of the things they did were great. In other instances, they didn't prove to be successful. And so there was a growing frustration because a lot of these folks who were being released were going back into black communities and uh, ha- and doing a lot of the same things that they had they were arrested for to begin with. And so we did see a shift in black male votes um, in the 2022 election because the county judge did run on or excuse me, the challenger did run on a message of trying to reform the judiciary from her seat, even though it's an administrative seat, they still have fiscal control over the court system and over the district attorney's office and things like that. So there was a heavy focus on that. So we saw a shift there. Um, we've seen with the with the school takeover that I mentioned before, it has been largely black women that have been pushing back against the state for the takeover, which is it's a really unique situation because the legislation that was filed that made way for the takeover was filed and passed by a black Democrat. And so the black Houston Democrat who filed the legislation, all of the Houston delegation of black Democrats voted in favor of the legislation. And then now that the legislation is taking effect and the school district is being taken over, um, we have a, a large contingent of black women who are uh, angry at Governor Abbott and the state and kind of putting blame there rather than putting blame on those officials. I mean, we even have one who was on the school board at the time, did not oppose it. And now she's a state rep and she's also putting pointing blame towards the governor. And so we haven't seen that shift in regards to education yet. Most of that has been them moving with their feet to different places, not so much voting differently. Um, but we hope that's the case. I mean, the, we, we are involved just like many other groups in the region with massive educational efforts, trying to get people to truly understand the link between, you know, the activism side of things, the voting side of things and what the outcomes are from that. And also trying to get people just more engaged in their city and in their county and and showing up to these meetings and speaking out on things that matter. Um, Because I think there has been a very easy uh, route for local uh, Democrat elected officials who may shoulder some of the blame for some of these issues to point towards the state and, and, you know, and have their electorate direct their anger there and have been successful in doing so. And so um, the the crime issue, I think, has driven more blacks to vote for Republicans here. But I don't think the education issue has done that much yet. I do think there is there is an opportunity for that to happen. I mean, I think that with HISD, that issue didn't really pop on the scene and in the minds of a lot of folks until the pandemic, when they started seeing what their kids were doing on the computer. And then after after that, when the takeover talk really started to kind of get loud and school ratings came out and they started to see which campuses had been failing consistently. So once that started happening, I think people got frustrated, but it's been so recent that I don't think we've seen a reflection in the polls just yet on that specific issue. Of course. And I think that's a really fascinating illustration of the diversity of views and motivations among black voters. I think because uh, at the national level, you've seen blacks vote so consistently for Democrats that people often can forget uh, that there are massive differences between regions and between different types of voters in terms of what gets them to the polls and what they're looking for in a candidate and what they're looking for in policy reform. But it doesn't really surprise me uh, to hear that you might have more black men who are motivated motivated particularly by the crime problem and wanting to focus on public safety. You might have more black women who are motivated by education uh, and opportunity for upward mobility among their children. Uh, And hopefully you have a variety of politicians, black and white, who are aware of these nuances and who are able to pitch messages that are tailored to the variety of different motivations that black voters have. But I wanted to talk about politics um, more broadly in the sense of what do you think is the politics? of a lot of these people who are relocating to the South and Southwest. I think on the one hand, you'd imagine that people who are looking for affordability, people who are looking for educational opportunity, people who are looking for safety uh, might be motivated to potentially uh, take a chance on Republican candidates or at least look for very moderate candidates. On the other hand, uh, you do have a, the question always of when people move from uh blue states to red states, uh, there's a suspicion of, are these, they're going to bring their values with them? Are they going to come here and maybe actually turn some of these conservative cities or conservative states uh, more blue? And you do sometimes see this happening um, in places where people relocate from historically democratic areas. And so could you give us a, a sense of uh, how the politics are, are shaking out among some of these uh, new arrivals? 
Yeah, I think so. I think where we're seeing that is it, we have two different areas. So the first area in our nonpartisan local elections, I think we are seeing a, a significant shift in that mindset there. I think they're looking at these individual candidates because they can't necessarily fall back to party line and different things like that. And they can't go to the ballot box and choose Democrat or Republican. They have to choose a person. And so I think in our in our local nonpartisan elections outside of school board, um, because those are off year and, and not during our general elections, you, you're you seeing a shift there because in, in certain districts that are um, either heavily black or just heavily immigrant in, in the city of Houston, we're seeing more over the years, more conservative candidates, still Democrats, but more conservative Democrat candidates being elected. Um, and in the areas that aren't predominantly minority, but are still electing Republicans and are having minorities move into them, you're seeing the Republicans win by wider margins there. So I do think that in those areas where they're seeing that they're getting better city services, that their elected officials more attentive to, to, attentive to the needs that they have, um, you know, things as simple as roads and, and infrastructure and uh, flooding concerns and all these things are being addressed. We do see that shift there. Now, at the, the state level, state Senate, state House um, in, in our statewide elected officials, where you have a primary election, and then a general election, we're not seeing the shift as much. I mean, Governor Abbott has done better with black voters than, in, than uh, a lot of the other statewide elected officials. But quite frankly, a, a lot of the rhetoric um, kind of overshadows what some of these candidates are out there trying to say. A lot of the, the statewide rhetoric from some elected officials and just from narratives from parties and things like that, I think overshadows what individual candidates say. And so that erodes some of that vote. But what I will say is that when you look into the areas that are kind of the exurbs, we're talking 30, 40 minutes outside of the city of Houston that have traditionally voted uh, conservatively and are now seeing an influx in, in Black and Hispanic residents, they are still electing these uh, these conservative elected officials. And we're not seeing any change in the vote share there. They're still, we're not seeing any gains among Democrats there, whether that's on the local or on the state level. Um, the only place you're seeing the shift from folks who are moving into an area and still voting the same way are in our urban areas for our partisan elections. So for instance, there's, a, there's one house district, house district 134, which covers a decent amount of the city of Houston and the medical center. Um, you traditionally, it's it was the only you know 50 50 district in the in the area for a long time and then it started slanting democrat as people continued to move in but these were very educated voters and so they they knew that the elected official that they had in there, which is a Republican named Sarah Davis, who was very moderate and attentive to their needs and had been there for uh, at least a decade was their best bet in having representation in senior senior representation in the Texas House. And so Democrats would often cross over in the Republican primary. They would forego their primary because they knew that up and down the ballot they weren't really going to have, you know, a say anyway. So they would they would go into the into the Republican primary and vote for her to make sure that they kept this moderate candidate that they liked. Um, eventually the trends caught up to her and in 2020 she was she lost to a Democrat. And um and in large part we saw a lot of black people and Hispanic people and some Southeast Asians moving into that district over the years. And so it did catch up and, and it flipped that district and it was kind of a full reset. Now they have a She's not a freshman anymore, but they had a freshman state representative who didn't carry nearly as much weight as the previous state representative. And they had to contend with that, um, especially for the largest medical center, uh, in, not just in, in the city, but in the state. And so we are seeing those trends um, in the cities. And, and I think the parties are doing a lot of work to try to reverse them. But again, I think they're in this kind of place of competing between broader narratives that they can't always control, whether that's coming from candidates, whether that's coming from the national party or any individual local party, um, and then trying to sell that message by candidates. And, you know, and, and I'm often out talking to folks as well. Um, and as a conservative, I get asked to explain, answer, explain statements made by other people or made by parties. And, and that's not the role that I'm in. You know, I'm there to talk about specific policy. So I can only imagine that for these candidates, it's, it's even worse when you're constantly being asked to explain for these other things rather than talking about the issues that matter most to you or that you want to address in that in that race. And so I think as we go on, ideally, 
in our cities will do a better educational effort and kind of a, a strong push to educate the people moving into the city that the things that they were moving from um, are, are why they're here and they should not vote the same. Um, and I think the state and the state elected officials statewide, as well as the party need to catch up because those demographics, uh, those demo- they're going to have to contend with those demographics in short order. We're going to see that come within the next 10 to 15 years. Ted Cruz uh, won his election. I think it was just by you know, two points or so, if I'm not mistaken, uh, it might've been larger than two points, but it was very tight for a very long time that night watching the election come in with Beto. And we think that with Cornyn's upcoming election and, and Ted Cruz's upcoming election, the, the margin's going to be wider. I think they've done both done a lot of work over the years in, in building a base and, and, you know, reaching out to folks who don't traditionally vote Republican. But we still have to recognize that those issues are there and that we're going to have to start engaging with these people moving here and getting them to truly understand what has made Texas you know, the bastion uh, of freedom and and opportunity and affordability that has caused them to move here in the first place. Absolutely. And I'm glad that you separated this discussion of the political shift into general elections on one hand and primary elections on the other. In the general elections, it does seem as if you have a lot of uh, Republicans overperforming uh, compared with their historic performance among blacks recently. Um, there has been a slight shift um, and th- in a close election that can be enough to shift the balance. Um, but the more pronounced impact that we're able to see so far has been in the primaries. It seems as if a lot of black voters uh, actually are relatively moderate compared with uh, white liberals, uh, particularly on issues like policing, education, and you do see blacks exerting an influence of moderation on the types of candidates who Democrats are not choosing to nominate. Uh, And so if you really want to look at sort of black political realignment in the near term, it seems um, more fruitful to focus on those primary elections uh, because they really are having a a big impact there. But I also want to add one more thing to that. I I think you made such a great point. And, you know, in a lot of these elections where it is tight, that's where it matters. We had a a district, District I for Houston City Council, and our district members represent 250,000 people apiece and it was an election that was that was won by 10 votes and so when you get down to to the nuts and bolts of it 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 doesn't take much to flip an election like that and luckily that election was between someone who was moderate and someone who was a little less moderate it wasn't you know a wide difference between the two um i think people more voted on personality than anything else but you do see these very close elections and we've even had state rep primary elections that have been very close in that sense as well. And so it really, there is, there needs to be a significant educational effort in particularly in the primaries, but just overall to get people to understand that because some of these elections are very close. And as some of these areas continue to get more populated, I expect them to kind of keep that going until finally there's a break. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I couldn't agree more. I I also want to broaden a little bit and uh, talk about how the shift of blacks back toward the South is uh, kind of changing the face of culture um, and black identity in the country. I think it's interesting to think about how, you know, when I was growing up, uh, when we were growing up, the black capitals of the United States that people would think of were really Harlem in New York City and Chicago. This is where, you know, people thought of, uh, you know, the most influential blacks in the world of culture, um, in the world of business and politics lived. These were sort of the fonts of national black culture and identity. Um, it seems as if the, movement of blacks uh, to the Sun Belt has coincided with the relative increase in the standing of Atlanta and Houston, particularly as what people think of as the black capitals, uh, as where kind of the most prominent figures in black American culture are living. Is that something that you could sense uh, being in Houston or something that you even detect nationally that there is a shift uh, back toward the South um, in terms of how black identity is being generated uh, and where the kind of most prominent black figures are choosing to live uh, and to collaborate with one another. Yeah, very much so. And, and I think I've even seen that just in the decade that I've lived here, you know, there, there, when I got here, there was still a, a sense of black identity, but in the past five years, it seems to have really exploded. I mean, you know, in, in every facet too, you know, the mayor likes to claim that we have the most black startups um, of any place in the country. I've not independently verified that, but I will take his word for it. Um, but you also see just a lot of reinvestment in in black neighborhoods and black community, uh, black owned businesses where um, there's a, they 
an old, old, old dance hall that is in the third ward here that was kind of a staple of the black community in the 50s, 60s, and 70s that shut down. Um, and now you have a lot of black entrepreneurs who are reinvesting in that to reopen it. They're trying to create this kind of open air space as well that that houses a lot of black owned businesses um, and different craft businesses to really foster that that sense of community. And we've been seeing that all, it's in a, a lot of the black restaurant tours have been some of the ones who've led that charge. You know, we have got um, a place called Lucille's here, which is a, a southern restaurant, southern uh, country style re restaurant. And uh, they have spent a lot of time along with uh, a restaurant called The Breakfast Club in trying to encourage other um, black chefs and black restaurateurs to invest in in growing this community. And so we've seen, you know, black tech meetups, black startups. Um, just everything that you can imagine that you've seen in the other cities that you mentioned, kind of the legacy cities that we've come to know to be the, the, the cultural hubs of the black Renaissance. We're starting to see those things here. And it's really nice because not only is it just happening organically, but it, it's intentional as well. There is that investment there because they know that there's, this is a great opportunity for folks. And that if you build on the things like affordability and, and tax and regulatory structure and take advantage of these, you could really see a, of just a booming of it. And so even in, in terms of tourism, we've been seeing a lot of that as well with, I, I every time I go scroll on Instagram, you know, there's a, a new black creator that's highlighting Houston and trying to highlight all the opportunities that are here. There are black creators that are highlighting the affordability of these different suburbs and exurbs that we've discussed. And so I do see that to be, and I mean, Atlanta's obviously, I think Atlanta's probably still beating us a little bit with that, but Houston is attempting to catch up in, in, very, in, in a number of ways. And what they're doing is they're not even trying to keep it in a lot of the predominantly black neighborhoods, they're moving it out into other parts of the city so that that culture is being integrated and being made a fabric within the fabric of the city of Houston, not being kind of stowed away or separate and apart, but it's actually truly in the fabric of Houston. And I think people are fully embracing it. Um, and what's nice is also going to some of these places and seeing other cultures come in because they want to witness this or they want to take part in it and recognize what's happening. So it has been, it's been amazing to see. And I think it's going to continue to grow as the mayor has been doing his best to try to lure more of these black businesses here and um, you know, and, and trying to redirect city funds and, and economic development funds to boost some of these opportunities for them. So I do think we're going to continue to see that that new renaissance, if you will, um, grow in places like Houston and, and Atlanta. And I think even Dallas is going to start catching up at some point. I don't think they're there yet, but they're certainly uh, they're certainly on their way. Um, and it's it's a great thing to see. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things you just touched on there is the amount of investment that's taking place in some of these fast growing cities in the South and Southwest at the community level and businesses being founded. I think that it's hard to overstate how influential government jobs and union jobs were in the original Great Migration. A lot of blacks moved to those cities uh, because they wanted to find uh, a stable rung on the economic ladder. And the idea was that these government jobs that are being integrated are going to allow them to enter the workforce, uh, whereas discrimination had kept a lot of them out in the South. And so you had a lot of blacks uh, working in schools, working in other public services, sanitation department, things like that, um, when they first arrived in these cities. Uh, and then the unions also. Uh, you saw unions were very, very uh, pro-integration um, in cities like Detroit, cities like Chicago uh, during the economic boom in the 20th century. But what we've seen is that that failed to create what we would call generational wealth. You did see a lot of blacks finding stability in these positions, uh, finding good benefits. Uh, and these are still things that a lot of middle and working class blacks prize, but they were not able to really build up enough wealth to eventually become homeowners, to pass on wealth to their children, to provide more opportunity in a way that was going to increase down the line. Uh, and it seems as if that's also one of the factors uh, leading people uh, to move towards Towards the South, which is less unionized, and these states also have much smaller governments and, and fewer public services, but often more robust private sectors. And I, I, I wonder if you could comment on that, sort of the, the difference in the sorts of job opportunities uh, blacks are pursuing uh, in the Sun Belt. Yeah. 
Well, and you know, I, I love the story because that's that's the story of my family. My my dad, yeah, like I said before, they, he was a, a janitor in the school district and they wanted a house. I mean, that was something that they've always wanted. And the reason that he focused on government employment was the opportunity to have that pension after and had that sustainability for after he retired or God forbid something happened to be able to make sure that everyone's taken care of. But it wasn't until he retired and then decided to move back to South Carolina was he actually able to get that house simply because of the cost that you find um, up in the Northeast. And so now he's living there. My parents are living pretty comfortably given given the pension that they obtained from from their government service and, and where they're living now. And I think here, yes, you have if you go back and you look at the Houston workforce, it's 22,000. I think it's probably roughly 67 percent black. It's um, it's much older because a lot of those black people have taken those jobs previously and have held on to them. And, and you still have many who are entering it from different levels, whether that's in public works or police, a fire department, just a whole host of different areas. But it is largely the economic opportunities found outside of that that are giving Houston the boost that it, and Houston and other Sunbelt cities the boost that they need. And I think it is the, the the jobs at in oil and gas, at the refineries, the technical jobs there, but also the startup jobs. We have a lot of organizations here that um, will tech startup organizations that bring people in and, and then facilitate their education. We're really putting a lot of money in kind of small urban manufacturers and trying to get people in neighborhoods to start backyard businesses. And um, we have a lot of different uh, uh, workshops, if you will. We have a, it's like labs. There's a place called Texas RX Labs, where if you want to start a business and you don't have the facility, you can go and you rent out kind of a bay there and at some other places in within that facility offer tool rental and supply rental and things like that. And you can start a business without having much startup capital. And I think lowering those barriers to entry is what's really helping people not just get jobs for themselves and, and you know, create that general race, generational wealth for them and their families, but it's helping them employ others as well. And so we are seeing a massive diversification. And again, the hospitality industry from hotels to we have just south of us, Galveston, which uh, you have um, a, a very large uh, cruise ship uh, uh, port there, as well as the hospitality industry that's just on the beach in Galveston and, you know, the restaurants and hotels here in the city of Houston. And you so you have a, a just a wide array of jobs and you still have um, the school districts, which employ a lot of folks. And you have so many different independent school districts across the state, I mean, across the region. And so while that is a government job, people are taking advantage of those as well. But it offers you whatever you want, whatever opportunity that you want or that you want to create, you are able to do that. And in large part, it goes back to that low low barrier to entry because of the tax and regulatory structure that a lot of these cities need to continue to um, invest in and support so that they don't end up like these other cities. But I definitely think that's a draw. I mean, I know I moved here for work 10 years ago and as we said off camera you know it's supposed to be six months and it turned into 10 years mm -hmm. but i think that's the story for a lot of folks as they they come to try it out and they recognize that there is so much opportunity for upward mobility here that they choose to stay Right. And of course, there's a, a major role of policy in sustaining that. Uh, and so that's something that uh, a lot of the politicians in uh, these Sunbelt cities should really pay attention to. Uh, you know, what are the reasons uh, that we're able to draw so many of these newcomers and let's make sure that we double down even as we continue to grow and develop. But the last question I wanted to pose to you is about integration uh, in these regions. Uh, I think that it's ironic that a lot of people associate the South with segregation, of course, because it existed there for the hundred years uh, following the abolition of slavery. You had blacks and whites living very separately, um, whereas in the North, uh, you have some of these cosmopolitan cities and the sense is that there are fewer barriers and there's less discrimination. But from my own personal perception, uh, my sense is that in a lot of these Northern cities, the separation of blacks and whites is actually very stark, uh, that if you go to places like New York, Chicago, you find blacks inhabiting and entire neighborhoods uh, with very few whites present and vice versa. Whereas if you go down to the south, and I have family in, in Athens, Georgia in particular, I was there recently, if you go to middle class neighborhoods, you tend to find blacks and whites coexisting, living in the same neighborhoods at a much higher rate. Um, and it, it doesn't surprise me when I really observe this in the sense that I, I see quite a lot of 
cultural commonality between middle class whites and middle class blacks in the South. I, you know, I'm not a Southerner myself, and so I don't want to be too reductive. But uh, as far as I can see, there, there does tend to be a kind of a, you know, faith, family and football culture. Uh, you know, there, there are certain uh, ways of life. There are certain interests and habits that are common among whites and blacks in the South in a way that's much less true in the North. And so I wonder if among these newcomers, do you see a lot of people moving to black neighborhoods and still a stark divide among blacks and whites? Or do you think that these Sunbelt cities are an, an example of increasing integration? Yeah. Well, it, you know, it's funny you said because we have a conversation here pretty regularly that that the middle class blacks and whites have much more in common than, you know, the middle class and then the upper class blacks have in common and, and the middle class and upper class or lower class and upper class whites have in common because they do share that commonality that 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 you can find on that socioeconomic rung of the spectrum. And so what we are seeing here is that, yes, when when people are moving here, when black people are moving here, they're they may initially move to a black neighborhood because they might find some level of comfort there. But once they understand the city, once they get a good footing of, of where everything is, they do typically move to a place like Pearland, which is very integrated um, or Sugarland or the Woodlands or anywhere else. They, they kind of assimilate into whatever neighborhood that they choose to want to live in. And in large part, it's because they can afford to and they, they're not kind of cordoned off to a certain area because that's the only place that they can live. But also they find this. Everyone wants the same amenities. Everyone wants good neighborhood amenities. They want safe neighborhoods. They want good roads. They want flooding to be taken care of. They want a lot of these similar things. And so what we're seeing is that they don't necessarily care about the color of their neighbor as long as they have a neighbor that they like or a neighbor that they can tolerate. And so I think that is why you do see a lot of black people moving out to these suburbs and excerpts and i think traditionally in the you know it, it, up until probably the 80s you did not see a lot of black people moving into these um these unincorporated parts of harris county or these suburbs and excerpts out just outside of harris county largely they were staying in in the city of houston in the first ward second ward third ward fifth ward places like that because that's where the hubs were but it, i think so much opportunity and so much knowledge is just opened up as to what it means to be in some of these other places that there's a certain level of comfortability that can be found there and you are seeing a lot of folks move there um again i think initially you might find some who come in in find a place where they might be culturally comfortable initially but once they get a good understanding of the city we're starting to see them move out and i think the same goes to the same can be said for um, immigrants moving to the city of houston who might initially go into a hub that they feel comfortable with but then eventually move out once they get to a position of being able to purchase a home or something like that or even move into a better apartment mm -hmm. well that's a really optimistic picture that you've painted. And I'm really glad to hear uh, that it sounds like the American dream really is bearing itself out in a lot of these uh, cities and the, the suburbs around them in states like Texas, states like Georgia, states like Florida. Uh, and this trend is accelerating, as we mentioned, and it looks likely to continue uh, in years to come. So thanks very much, Charles, uh, for helping us paint this picture. I really appreciate your insights and observations. Uh, and I hope that both of us can uh, continue to uh, monitor this trend and uh, uh, talk about its implications for American life and politics. Yeah, well, certainly. Thank you for having me. I enjoyed the conversation. And, you know, I just hope that we can uh, keep this trend going and we don't do anything to mess it up. But I, I appreciate the opportunity to chat with you about it and definitely looking forward and, uh, to keeping up to date with you on, on these changes. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much. Listeners, don't forget to check out Charles's work for City Journal, as well as all of his research for urban reform. If you like what you heard, please like and subscribe to the podcast. And thank you for joining us for another episode of Manhattan Insights.